Hello, everybody. This is Chuck Carnival, co-founder of FastGraphs, the fundamentals analyzer software tool, also known by many as Mr. Valuation. Once again, it's my pleasure to welcome you to a subscriber request Tuesday where I try to cover a company that's been asked by subscribers that they want to look at. And this week, I'm going to be looking at Enbridge, the oil and gas pipeline company, midstream limited partnership energy company that a lot of people are asking about. And this is kind of an unusual stock that I'll be explaining and kind of getting into. But there are some real interesting factors about analyzing a company like Enbridge that I hope I'll be able to bring some additional insights into how you can think about companies like this. So let's go ahead and move into fast graphs and look at Enbridge. And first thing I want to point out is I want you to note that the company's earnings growth has actually been pretty decent. So I'm going to take the prices off the graph for a moment. I want you to note that the company has grown earnings at a rate of about 9% per year. The white line on this graph is the dividend. The earnings yield is 5.59% currently because it trades at a 17.89 blended PE and offers a 6.68% current dividend yield. But what I want you to notice about the dividend is that the payout ratio, the dividend payout ratio is over 100%. In other words, they're paying out more in dividends than they're earning. And you can see that very clearly down here at the bottom of the graph. In 2020, they earned $1.90 and paid out $2.42. Now, there are some reasons for that, which I'll get into. From a standpoint of the stock price, if I look at how the market has valued this stock, they've typically valued it at about a blended P.E., of somewhere in the 20s, the actual you know calculation comes out to 21.48, which is the PE of this blue line on the graph. But you can see there are times when the company stock price is traded at a much higher PE, and there are times when the company stock price is traded at a much lower PE. But the real question here is that obviously earnings are a very difficult metric, which I'll explain why here in a few moments, to evaluate a stock like Enbridge, an oil and gas storage and pipeline company like Enbridge. Now, if I go looking at some of the other metrics like I like to do, let's go into gap earnings. And I want you to notice that they almost perennially pay out more than 100% of gap earnings, which includes a lot of non-cash charges and you know accounting conventions and accelerated depreciations and so on. So obviously, earnings aren't really that important. Now, if we look at this stock from a standpoint of long-term performance. Let's go ahead and do that next. If I look at this stock from a standpoint of long-term performance, so what I'm doing is I'm going back to December of 2000, investing $10,000, and I want you to note that you'd have started out with a relatively low dividend yield by doing that. And the reason for that is, is because the company was paying a very low dividend back then, okay? Six cents a share, seven cents, eight cents, et cetera. And then as time goes on, the dividend began to grow. And more recently, we see that it's been paying this 5 or 6%, but they've also had amazing dividend growth over this period of time. Now, that brings up maybe some more questions than it does answers at this point. So let's go ahead and then look at, since this is an income vehicle today with a, over a 6% yield, and you know earnings aren't covering the dividend what about cash flows? I think cash flows are how you really evaluate dividend safety. But the cash flow picture is actually a little bit confusing as well, in addition to the earnings number. Because when I look here, I do see that, first of all, cash flow, let's take price off the graph again. We can see that cash flows have covered the dividend. And in more recently, starting in 2011, the cash flows have really covered the dividend, but they've also been relatively erratic. Now, cash flow has grown by over 20% over the long run. But if I shorten this time frame, we've dropped that down to 12%. I shorten it down a couple of more years here, and we start to see that recently cash flow has only been growing by about 3%. Okay. Now, if I put price on the graph at this point, and even the normal price to cash flow, we see that the company trades at around 10 times normal cash flow in the last several years. But the cash flow is covering the dividend. When I look at performance here, I see that the operating cash flow payout ratio has, you know, been positive or, or you know, 62%, 63% was the highest, often in the 35, 40% range. So the company is covering their dividend with cash flow. 
Now, it also has struggles to generate free cash flow. I think that's important because that's a metric that I typically like when I'm looking at dividend-paying stocks. But there have been many years where the company didn't really provide any free cash flow. So, you know, it's kind of confusing when you look at this. So what I'm going to do now is, well, I mean, before I do it, I want to look at a couple other metrics. If you look at EBITDA, which is a form of cash flow, we see good dividend coverage. When you look at operating margin or earnings before interest and taxes, we see good dividend coverage. But now watch this. When you look at sales, sales per share have been dropping dramatically in the last several years. So that would be a big red flag. Okay, but again, all of this mystery that I've been talking about here or kind of alluding to can become clearer when we move on and go into the financial underlying numbers and look at what we call fund graphs or financial underlying numbers and fast graphs. And first of all, let's start with the millions graph and let's look at common shares outstanding. One of the things about these pipeline companies, they're very capital intensive and there are times when they are real aggressive issuing shares. They were real aggressive issuing shares from 2001 up through 2004, and then they reduced their share count dramatically. But then from 2005 through the Great Recession even, you know, all the way into 2010, they raised their share count, and then they reduced their share count again. And then if we, you know, shorten this graph to just the last several years, since 2011, you know, they were kind of modestly increasing their share count through 2016. Then they increased it by over 66%, almost 67% in 2017, followed by 13%, 17%, and then they've kind of stayed flat in 2020. Now, when I look at this data quarterly, more recently, the last 12 quarters, they've kept their share count pretty consistent. But the moral of the story here is that they issue shares a lot because the company is constantly reinvesting. I'm talking about investing something according to Zach's. I think it was 10 or $12 billion in 2021 alone in the new you know, product offerings. They're going to do over a billion in renewables. The company's um, you know, primarily, obviously, in the oil and natural gas pipeline business. Some of the advantages of this company, by the way, that I might mention according to Zach's are that, first of all, According to Zach's, they have the longest and most sophisticated oil and liquids pipeline system in the world that covers around 17,000 miles, with a big portion of their assets being contracted by shippers over the long run. So that does give them some stability as far as their business and their business growth. Okay, they expect 17 billion, this is Canadian dollars now in midstream, because it's a Canadian based company, in midstream growth capital projects to be executed. They recently signed a $3 billion to build a big oil export terminal. So, you know, the company's constantly investing capital. I think that's real important. But again, they're headquartered in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. They're a leading energy infrastructure company. And, you know, one of their primary businesses is a transportation of systems that spread across over, as I said, 17,000 miles globally. OK, and, you know, now there is some controversy on this company. The Biden administration talked about closing, you know, their line five. Uh, they're in fighting in courts in Michigan. Apparently right now the federal courts have you know, kept that argument in the federal courts, which some people consider a benefit to Enbridge. So there's political risk, there's energy and, you know, oil and gas risk over the long run with renewables, the company's moving into renewables. So there's a lot of things to consider here. But I think the big thing to consider is the fact that this company is always issuing new shares or has constantly issued new shares. I think that's something that, you know, you need to be aware of. This is the capital structure of this company is constantly changing. I think that's the real point I'm trying to make. So now when I look at that, if I go through my 18 points, I've covered most of them. I'm into the fund graph section or the financial section now where I'm on number eight, where I've covered share buybacks. If I go into number nine and look at cash flow from operations, which is, you know, real important, I want to go and look at, I want to see cash from operations covering net income. Okay, so operating cash flow greater than net income. And I'm getting that with the company. So that's sort of a positive. But then I get into this really interesting one here. I'm going to get into sales growth. Okay, so we're going to go back to the income statement here. 
and we're going to look at revenue growth. And what's really interesting here is that if I'm looking at revenue growth, it's really kind of pretty strong from a standpoint of total revenues. You know, we got you know they had a couple of down years in 2015 and 16. Then they had some really good revenue growth, and of course, COVID came. And then if I look at it through the most recent quarters, in through September of 2021. You know, they're, through COVID, their revenues decreased, but then their revenues have started to increase again. Now, this is total revenues in millions. I want to make that clear. You know, we're back on track. COVID's over or, or not over, but, you know, the big effects of that are passing and we're starting to see revenue growth again. But now what's interesting is if I go into per share data, okay, and this is what I was showing you earlier, and I look at per share revenues, Per share revenues have been dropping dramatically, as I showed you earlier. And of course, that's because what's happening is we're seeing, you know, common shares outstanding, you know, have increased so much here recently that I'm sorry, I have to go to the millions graph. I knew I was having trouble finding it here. Common shares outstanding have increased so much, you know, not in the last couple of, not in the last 12 quarters, but they've certainly increased dramatically, you know, over the years, let me get rid of the revenue here, you know, over the last 10 years, they've increased dramatically, which is why the revenues per shares have fallen. Okay, so that's, you know, somewhat problematic for the company, but sticking in the in millions graph here, and we go back into the income statement, and let's look at net income again, because I think net income is important here. And we're seeing pretty good net income growth overall. You know, occasionally, again, this company has, you know, so many capital projects and, and it's, you know, constantly reinvesting money and so on. But net income growth has been, you know, pretty good. Now, the debt to equity ratio is really a problem, I think. If you look at the company's debt versus their cash, for example, and let me find that for you here. If we go into the balance sheet and look at cash, okay, they have, you know, uh, let me do the quarterly data for you. They have about 400, you know, plus million in cash. But then if I go on the balance sheet and look at total debt, you know, their total debt just is just enormous. You know, it's it's over almost six billion in total debt. So the company does have a lot of debt. That's another, you know, big red flag that I would, you know, put out there. So, you know, it's a very hard company to analyze, a very hard company to evaluate. From my point of view, I consider this a very complex company. I'm not sure it's even for everybody, and it's not one that I'm real attracted to for all the reasons. But having said that, it does have a lot of good cash flow coverage. It does pay a good dividend, and the dividend is the real story here. Okay, now I do want to point out a couple of other things out here. I'm going to go into fast graphs here and I'm going to look at the last 15 years of the stock and I'm going to use the additional settings here and I'm going to reinvest the dividends and look at performance because you know the company's paying a high dividend here recently and if you look at that you can see that they've thrown off a lot more income than the market but they've underperformed the market in capital appreciation now that's not a totally fair comparison because I'm looking at Enbridge being, you know, moderately, let's say, fully valued, where I'm comparing it to a market that's really highly valued. So I do want to make that clear. But reinvesting dividends in a stock like this can make it be a decent return vehicle over the long run valuation considerations, you know, taken into consideration. But very, very difficult company to analyze, very convoluted capital structure constantly reinvesting money. The company is on the verge of trying to re, you know, define themselves into investing a lot more in renewables, but that's still a very small part of their business. But all in all, it does have a good long-term record. The company's cash flows do cover the dividend quite nicely. So if you're looking for current yield and good dividend growth, so let's just look at the last, you know, period of time here when the company's been generating cash flow growth of about 2%. You can see that they've still been able to throw off about almost 10%, right at 10% dividend growth in spite of that. And they've got plenty of dividend coverage here. You know, the dividend is being very well covered by their operating cash flow. 
does have a lot of debt, something to think about, but it is triple B plus rated. But anyway, that's Enbridge. This was a subscriber request. I want to be clear. I was asked to cover this company. It's not one that I would have probably showed you. I do think the company is reasonably priced today relative to its future growth. I'm using the normal multiple of around nine or 10 times operating cash flow the company you know appears to be reasonably priced today and it does offer a decent rate of return based on operating cash flow growth of about 9% going forward trading at about a 9 multiple you know that would be giving you double digit return potential so from that point of view it probably does look okay notwithstanding all the risks associated with energy companies Biden's administration trying to close their line five pipeline through Michigan there and the Michigan courts, of course, fighting with that. So there's a lot of uncertainty here, I guess. But on the other hand, I do think energy through the oil and gas sector is here to stay. This company does have long term contracts. They are generating cash flow. They are continuing to you know reinvest in their business. So, you know, but again, it's not the easiest company I've ever had to examine or ever tried to examine. So anyway, that's Enbridge subscriber requested. If you found this video um, worthwhile, please give me a like, ring the bell, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And uh, also, you might want to take a closer look at FastGraphs, the Fundamentals Analyzer software tool. I wouldn't even think about investing without it personally. Anyway, thanks for watching. I'll talk to you again real soon.